Welcome back to our study of 2 Kings. We are in 2 Kings chapter 21 today. We'll go through most of the chapter, but we'll stop at verse 18. We're going to focus on the reign of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings that Judah ever had, but we're going to see that there was a happy ending, so to speak, to Manasseh's reign despite his great wickedness. So let's see what 2 Kings has to tell us. Beginning in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Okay, so right off the bat, we're told that Manasseh was a wicked king. Uh, We're told he had a long reign, 55 years. And uh, his wickedness is connected not to the nation of Israel and their wicked kings. Uh, It's not connected to Jeroboam, for example. Uh, It's not connected to any of the uh, earlier uh, wicked kings. Instead, it's connected, his wickedness is connected to the people that God drove out of the promised land before uh, Israel, so that Israel could have the promised land. They were driven out, not just so Israel could live there, but they were driven out because of their sin, because of their iniquity. You can see some of the despicable things that were going on in those nations uh, if you read Leviticus 18, for example. So uh, his sin is grievous. It's great. Now, he's not the first king to have his sin compared to the nations uh, that were driven out before Israel. Ahaz had something similar said about him in 2 Kings 16, verse 3, where it says, he even burned his son as an offering according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. So this is not a new comparison, but a connection to Ahaz is not good, right? These were both wicked men, wicked kings, who did very evil things. So we keep going, verse 3, it says, For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal, and made an Asherah, as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering, and used fortune-telling, and omens, and dealt with mediums, and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So let's just pause there. And you can tell very quickly, right, how wicked Manasseh was. Idolatry was pervasive in his reign, it sounds like. It was not just, you know, one little idol over here. He's worshiping all kinds of things, all kinds of gods, uh, restoring the high places, also not good, probably idolatry going on there. He even is bringing idolatry into the very temple of the Lord where God alone uh, is to be worshipped. Of course, God alone is to be worshipped, period. But especially to bring idolatry into the temple is a grievous sin, right? Okay, we keep going. Verse 7, it says, And he, uh, excuse me, and the carved image of Asherah that he had made, he set in the house of of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So again, that emphasis on the fact that in God's own house, in God's own temple, Manasseh has brought in idolatry. Not only that, he burned one of his sons as an offering, He's doing all kinds of things that God has clearly said are wicked and evil and are not to be done by his people. And yet here they are being done by the leader of God's people, their own king. 
Now, what's the consequence of this going to be? Look at verse 8. God said, oh, this is continuing um, what uh, is being said to David and to Solomon about the temple, right? Verse 8. God says, and I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers, if only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. And verse 9 says, but they did not listen. And Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. Okay, so here are two very strong indications that Judah is going to be removed from the promised land, that they are going to go into exile. This is not the first time we've encountered this uh, idea that uh, Judah is going to be exiled. This has been, this has already come up earlier in the book of 2 Kings, but here it's very clear, right, where God says, I'm not going to cause my people to wander out of the land anymore as long as they do what I've commanded them. And yet we've just been told Manasseh is doing exactly what God commanded them not to do. So if they're not obeying what God commanded, they're probably not going to get to stay in the land. Um, and then the second indication is in verse 9, where we're told that Manasseh was doing even worse things than the nations were doing whom God drove out of the land before Israel came in. So if they were driven out because of their sin, and now Israel, or excuse me, Judah is doing even worse things, it stands to reason, that Judah could be expected uh, to be removed from the land by the Lord as well. So this is not good, right? But we know where this is going. We know the end of the story in 2 Kings. It is going to end in the Babylonian exile, in the nation of Babylon, taking Judah into exile and destroying the temple. What we're seeing right now is why God do, did that, why it was justified that things were so bad in Judah that even that dramatic uh, end, so to speak, which is not the full end of the story, but is where this book ends, more or less. Uh, it was justified. It was deserved. And it was coming for a long time. All right, let's keep going. Verse 10. And the Lord said by his servants, the prophets. Okay, so God is speaking into this situation through the prophets so that we know. We don't have to wonder what God thinks about this. God is going to tell us. Verse 11. Here's what God says through the prophets. Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did who were before him and has made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. All right, so first thing, God tells us that there are going to be consequences for Manasseh's sin. The evil things that he has done, God is going to respond to. And so there are, uh, there is destruction coming, right? Um, because of what Manasseh has done, it says, um, verse 12, you know, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. So that this, what's coming is a result, a consequence of Manasseh's sin. All right, what's going to happen? Verse 13. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Okay, what does this mean? What, what about these references to Samaria and to Ahab? Well, remember, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And at this point in the story, Israel has already been taken into exile by the Assyrians because of their idolatry. That happened back in chapter 17. Uh, the house of Ahab was destroyed. Remember, Ahab was a wicked king 
Uh, he was married to Jezebel. Uh, he was wrapped up in the worship of Baal. And back in 1 Kings chapter 21, it says that Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And Elijah answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. In other words, what's happening here when God says, I will stretch out over Jerusalem, the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. He's saying what happened to Ahab's house, what happened to Samaria is now going to happen to Jerusalem. Ahab's house was judged, right? Samaria was captured and the people taken into exile. The same kind of thing is going to happen now to Jerusalem because of the sin that Manasseh has led the people of Judah into. So verse 14 says, And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. So when he says, I'm going to forsake the remnant of my people, it doesn't mean that there won't be any remnant left at all, but Judah already is a remnant. Remember, Judah was what remained with the house of David after Solomon's sin and after Solomon's reign. The kingdom of Israel, right, was made up of 10 tribes and they were separated from Judah. So Judah's already sort of a remnant here and they're being referred to as this remnant. God is saying, now this, I'm going to do the same thing to Judah. Judah is going to be forsaken. Judah is going to be judged. And notice that he says, the reason for this in verse 15 is because of the, the sin they've done, the evil they've done. And not just during the reign of Manasseh, but he says, since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Now, have there been some good periods in Judah's history from the exodus from Egypt up until the reign of Manasseh? Yeah, of course. Hezekiah was a good king. David was a good king. Solomon was a good king. Of course, he uh, you know, was led astray toward the end of his life. David, of course, did some sinful things too. But on the whole, right, they were men who sought to honor God, at least at various points. Uh, there have been some good periods. But uh, taken as a whole, this sin and idolatry that Manasseh has led Judah into, it's not new, right? We can go all the way back to the golden calf right after the exodus from Egypt. Um, you can go back to the days of the judges. Uh, I mean, you could go back to, uh, you know, the reign of Saul. Saul was not a good king. Over and over, God's people and even the leaders appointed to lead God's people have sinned against the Lord, and God has been extremely patient with them, but now judgment is coming. Verse 16 says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made Judah to sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So not only his idolatry, but also Manasseh shed innocent blood. And then it says, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his house, in the garden of Uzzah, and Amon his son reigned in his place. Now, we encounter words like that at the end of these stories of these kings. And those, those endings remind us that what we are reading is not the whole of the story. For example, with Manasseh here, we're told he reigned for 55 years. What we're getting here is just a summary of Manasseh's wickedness. It's clearly not the whole story of his reign. In fact, in 2 Chronicles, which covers some of the same ground as 2 Kings does, in 2 Chronicles 33, we actually learn that there is a happy ending to Manasseh's story. That Manasseh finally comes to his senses 
and repents toward the end of his life. So listen, this is where we're going to close. Listen to 2 Chronicles 33, this starting verse 10. It says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Afterward, he built an outer wall for the city of David west of Gihon in the valley and for the entrance into the fish gate and carried it around Ophel and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders of the army in all the fortified cities in Judah. And notice this, he took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he threw them outside of the city. He also restored the altar of the Lord and offered on it sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. So it took a pretty distressing situation, right? Manasseh was captured and taken into Babylon. It took a pretty distressing situation for Manasseh to turn to the Lord. But he did, and he came to recognize that the Lord God of Israel is God. And so when God delivered Manasseh and Manasseh came back to Jerusalem, Manasseh repented. He got rid of the idols. He told people to serve the Lord. Manasseh was an incredibly wicked king. He had gone far, so to speak, down the path of wickedness and sin and idolatry. But he turned back. By God's grace, he repented. He was changed. And that ought to encourage us, both when we have sinned and we feel like we have strayed too far from the Lord to come back. Remember Manasseh. Manasseh had strayed far from the Lord. But he came back. He turned back. He cried out to the Lord. And the Lord heard him and restored him. Cry out to the Lord. Turn back to the Lord. And if there's someone in your life who's like a Manasseh, they're they're in deep darkness, they are in great sin, don't give up hope praying for them. Ask God to grant them repentance. Ask God to open their eyes. Ask God to do whatever it takes to bring them back to him. Because the Lord is able. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Not even bringing someone like Manasseh to repentance. The Lord is able, and the Lord is good. And as the Bible says, salvation belongs to the Lord. God bless.